So, David, did the Easter Bunny visit? Oh, God, the bloody Easter Bunny. Yep, I did. Got him. Yeah. And then I, I, I skinned him and just r- you put a little bit of rub on him, put him in the smoker. I hope bunny my brisket. kids are listening to this. Yeah, I didn't eat the Easter Bunny. <laughs> Thank God. Now, look, we are off enjoying our weekends away. I'm at yeah. Blues Fest in the midst of some great music. I'm playing with the smoker my wife gave me for Christmas <laughs> so and smoking. And, you know, I'm, I'm smoking. Take, read that as you would. Yes, and probably consuming large amounts of whiskey. Uh, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh. So with the Commonwealth Games on the way in Victoria and we also have the Queensland Olympics. That's about Brisbane to kick off Olympics. as well. And look, there's a yep. lot of controversy around the Commonwealth Games in Victoria because yes. it's regional Victoria. Re- oh, yeah. And How not, dare we? And we're not sure if we have the facilities, so there's... That's going to come up quite a bit. Yeah, and we do have a lot of the um, a lot of the people who are have been together in Brisbane, and they're starting to plan the Olympics that are going to happen in a few years. So I think it's probably good that we bring back an old little bite size. Our old little bite size with an old old friend of the podcast. Yeah, well, your your old friend. Yeah, old Ferg. Ferg, we love Ferg. Ferg, who has worked on many Olympics, many yes. Commonwealth Games. He knows how it all works. So let's have a listen to some of the stories about the Sydney Olympics and others that. He's been to. Yes, from a security perspective, with someone who actually knows what they're talking about. I'm just going to go back and smoke something else. Okay, bye. Welcome back to some snackable bites of I Spied. I Spied Light. Now, I Spied Light. I yeah. like that. Thank you. Now, remember your mate, Ferk. Yes. He was such a treat. I, he's a fabulous guy to talk to. Yeah, and he had so much content that, you know, we thought we'd save a little bit where he talks about the Olympics because I found this really fascinating. Oh, it was brilliant. It was really, really good yeah. stuff. So he's just going to lead us into how he got the job doing security for the Sydney Olympics. Amazing to think that a guy who was a bouncer went all the way to the top of the world. <laughs> he wasn't a bouncer. He wasn't a bouncer. You know, get to late 90s and I was running what was then called the Middle East branch and I was called by someone and said, we want you to go to Sydney and be the federal government person doing security planning for the Olympics. I said, why? And I said, well, you like sport. I said, <laughs> that, perfect qualification. Was, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I like sport. But yeah. um, I said, no, we need to help New South Wales police and others there with the planning. So... I came to Sydney and worked on that for three years. And at the end of it, I, I wasn't a Sydney sider, but I thought, no, well, this will do. I'll, there's no government jobs, of yeah. course, but um, I'll leave and I'll set up a company. So I set up this company called Intelligent Risk. Mm. And just to show that I'm, I'm no Chinese strategist, the business plan had nothing to do with major events written in it at all. Oh, right. wow. Because I thought, well, major events, government people do that. Yeah. You know, Atlanta, Sydney. But anyway... Didn't pick that change. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the phone rang after about six months. Myself and my two colleagues were sitting there looking at the phone as you do when you start a business and <laughs> don't know how you're going to get paid. <laughs> me. Yeah, or if you're an a- actor, you're just looking at it waiting for the agent to call. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and this voice with a heavy accent goes, I'm Carlos Nuzman, president of Brazil, Cobby, and we want you to fly to uh, Rio de Janeiro, business class tickets. President, president of, of the Brazil Olympic Committee. Oh, okay. I was like, President of Brazil. <laughs> no, no, you don't want to. You, you don't want a phone call from him. Yeah. No, 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 no. Like, yeah. whoa. But but I yeah. said, Bull Bar, you're not funny. Yeah. I thought it was a mate. Ah, right, 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 right. And, and he, oh, what what do you what you mean? What you mean? I, I said, Bull Bar, piss off, would you please? <laughs> and so the phone goes crash. Next day, a man called Carlos Roberto Osorio with perfect English. Because he'd been a CBS commentator in Brazil, rings yeah. and says, "I'm the Secretary General of the Brazil Olympic Committee. You really annoyed my president yesterday, and we so want you to get Bulba. on." It, it wasn't Bulba. You're like, oh. <laughs> so we got on a plane and we worked with the Brazilians for twelve years, on and off. Oh my God! First with the Pan American Games, then their yeah. first tilted and Olympics for 2012, yeah. then their successful 2016 first Olympics in South America. But it just snowballed. How much did it change with terrorism? 
in um, terms of security? Because we yep. saw, you know, at the Atlanta, it was yeah. Atlanta where they yeah, had the, the bomb. Yeah, the bombing in the yep. park. Yeah. Did that kind of fully change the way you, you approached uh, security? Well, when I took on the Sydney job, the number one risk to the Olympics in Sydney was mm. terrorist. Yep. We had intelligence coming at us that was credible, that there were plots to attack really? the games. From, do we know from where? Yeah, Hambali, the, the number two, the head of the operational Shura in uh, Al-Qaeda. Wow. Uh, who was also on the Shura for Jamar Islamia. Yep. And he was hiding out in Bangkok at the time. He directed people to recognise Sydney for attacks. Gee, I hope they weren't targeting Bondi because that's where I was working. <laughs> I had a Bondi really volleyball. No, I had a very important job at the volleyball. What, Very, what a great venue. Yeah, oh, so much fun. <laughs> I was the uh, courtside announcer. I was the basically on sand idiot. You got to look at half naked chicks play volleyball. Not just look at them. I got to stand <laughs> about five, six feet. I actually played one match. Mm, one wow. match was cancelled because uh, one of the Mexican players twisted his ankle. Yeah. And basically, the two American players that were on the court went, We want to play. And they turned around to the two American commentators who were both ex-volleyball players really? from Atlanta Great. and went, you've got kit, we know you've got it, get down on the sand. And two of us went, we'll, pl we'll play your warm-up game. <laughs> and it was the only time in the entire history of the Olympics that a ladder was taken out onto the beach volleyball court. And, yeah, we got spiked pretty badly on that ladder. I bet, I bet. Quite... <laughs> but, yeah, like to think that, I mean, the security around the Sydney Olympics was incredible. But also what was really amazing about it was it was almost invisible. Yeah, and so in terms of like getting that credible information that, you know, there are plots to yep. attack, did you have information of where that was going to be or what that might look um, like? There, there Can were, you talk about it? <laughs> there were three three core leads, if you like, mm. all credible because it was assessed by what we call the Federal Olympic Security Intelligence Centre in ASIO in okay. Canberra. That, oh my gosh. That, yeah. that one that yeah. I mentioned, then there was one uh, Abu Nadal organisation, a, a terrorist group which is lost in the mist of times yeah. now, but yeah, um, right. they, they had sent someone or wanted to send someone. They were Lebanon based? They had been, yeah. but they, at that time I think they were in Tripoli oh, okay. under the patronage of, oh, of course. Gaddafi. Oh, Gaddafi. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was another homegrown issue that we had. Really? Which is, which is well documented that there was a, a farm in rural New South Wales where people had been using high-powered weapons and small improvised explosive That's devices. Right. Yeah, yeah, really? Yeah, 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 and, yeah. And we don't know, and we I guess we'll never know to what extent they might have had aspirations to do anything around the Olympics, but mm. that was detected in, I'll say, July 2000, and the Games were September. Yeah, that's close. Um, yeah, yeah. When the people involved realised that they were under surveillance, they all left the country. Really? Boom, 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 boom. Wow. Um, now, a number of them have come back into the country since then, and you and your listeners will be delighted to know that I think every one of them, without exception, is in jail. Wow. They're doing time on other terrorism-related offences. They're enjoying the, the hospitality of the Australian government. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. But not, not on not on offences proven in relation to no, that. No, of course not. No. But subsequently. Right. Well, so, and that I would imagine has continued in terms of your line of work. There's a lot, there's a lot that you have to kind of think about. And do you work, like when you did Beijing, were you working closely with the government? Yeah, the agreement, because I still have, yep. a, I still have a national security clearances. Mm. The Chinese were told that we could assist them, but we had to advised through the embassy in Beijing of mm -hmm. what was happening and if we were asked to do anything untoward yep. or inappropriate. You like, had the right of, of first refusal, essentially. That's it. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> now, you've worked at a lot of Olympics. Now, you, you, you were telling us before we started recording that you worked at Sochi. Yep. So you were working for, for Vladimir. No, I was working for the International Olympic Committee doing yeah. a review. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. But not Vladimir. Not Vladimir. Not for, no, not for him. But did you have contact with... The Russian security yes. services. Yeah, yeah. And what was that like? Uh, rather rather peculiar, um, given, <laughs> given my past. But, you know, they were very professional in many mm. respects. Well, the thing is, even the adversaries, whether it's um, Iran or, or the KGB or yeah. the SVR, as it's known today, the acronym, of course, there's some very talented people get recruited. Of course. Um, I mean, I was. So somehow very I very talented, I not as an intelligence <laughs> officer, talented in other areas. I was amusing. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I was right for me. You, yeah, you kept people <laughs> kept people laughing. We, we were in downtown Sochi near a railway station called Adler with a number of people doing the security transport review around the, the main hub. Uh, and a chap sidles up to me, very urbane, very well dressed. I've got my jeans. And, you look fabulous. Uh, and um, he starts to recite me. There was movement at the station. The word had passed around. <laughs> the cult from old regret had got... I was going, what the hell? With a oh, Russian I'm accent? Rather, uh, with a Russian accent. Oh, God, that would have been awesome. Great. He said, I'm rather fond of Australian literature. I said, oh, which branch of the SVR are you in? <laughs> I, okay, that is... I don't get it. He was a Russian intelligence (laughs) officer. (laughs) I'm I'm interested in Australian literature. No one in Russia would be Um, Sorry, so that was a little like intelligence (laughs) humour. Sorry, I missed it. Sorry. (laughs) It was just a little nudge, hey? Hey, Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Send them all. There was a woman that station for where they passed around that the court from all the regret that got away. (laughs) If I'd been smarter, I could have quoted Boris Pasternak or something, but I didn't know any. Just throw a bit of Dostoevsky back in his face. Hey, what's he going to do? So that would have been interesting from a security perspective. Yeah, yeah. And did be, so? Did people fully trust you? Like you know, for Sochi, were they like they? I mean, places like you know, mm. like that, similar to China, quite insular, not a massive trust with with the Western world. Well, some people in these agencies don't trust anybody. Right, not even their best friends. Not even their relatives. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. You know, I, I can say that I haven't been working in government for 20 years in some parts of the world, and they just go, oh, yeah, sure. They don't believe it. Yeah, David says that as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, David, David's it's one big ruse. David's, yeah, David's totally. still in ASIO. I yeah. am an absolute spy master. Deep <sighs> cover. Yeah. Deep, deep, deep cover. So deep. <laughs> so deep you just don't know. So deep I'm drowning right now. <laughs> <laughs> Mariana Trench, nothing on it. James Cameron is actually going to sink to the depth that I am at and I'm currently working at. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love ending an app when we make fun of you. Yes. Well, that that is my point. I, I'm just here to be made fun of. But again, Ferg. I know. The brain on Ferg just blows my mind. I mean, anything in comparison <laughs> to you blows your yeah, mind. Yeah, pretty much everything blows my mind. There's not a lot of mind to blow. No. No.